Okay, so we, we getting sort of towards ready there? Okay, anyway, um, the uh, DVD discount, $100 if you order it today. So that's still on. And um, let's see, oh yeah, there's a, there's a fellow named Larry Oya. He's uh, spoken at some of our conferences before. He uh, does, uh, well, he sells the uh, Browns gas generators that George Wiseman makes. And what he's doing is just for this conference, he's offering a 10% discount on a Browns gas generator if it's ordered here at the conference. And uh, to get more details on that, you go back to the uh, table that has um, the uh, sparkling, the, the living water, uh, Vernon Ross family, they're way, they're way in the corner out that way. And uh, you can get that 10% discount and that'll help a lot of people in a lot of different ways. There it is, yes, it's 10% uh, off basic ER1200 brown gas generator. And that's if you order at the conference. Um, Okay, we ready? Okay. Our next speaker of the morning, one of our longtime favorites here, Moray King. Um, Moray has been with us since the very beginning in the old International Tesla Society days. He spoke at the first conference in 1984. He I'll continues to meticulously and honestly develop his theories and these are an excellent fundamental source of information on how to mathematically construct um, the uh, free energy that we need. Um, I've been impressed with Moray for a long time. He has three books out. This is one of them, Tapping the Zero Point Energy, The Energy Machine of T. Henry Moray, no relation, just an amazing coincidence, which is quite a story in itself. And the quest for zero point energy. All these by Moray King. He wasn't able to get his books here for the conference, so you can order them online through adventuresunlimitedpress.com. Moray has a BA in electrical engineering and a master's degree in systems engineering from the University of Pennsylvania and he comes from Orem, Utah. He gave me a great quote. He says he's working with ideas more extraordinary than science fiction. He says, they hide the big stuff in math. Here's Moray King. Well, thank you, Michael. I just love coming to this conference. I am so inspired by the speakers and all of you out there that I've been able to talk to. I want to give you a round of applause. <laughs> uh, when Lynn Horowitz, Horowitz gave the talk, uh, I, was, I received a quantum dump. Now that's the scientific term for revelation, as in I received the quantum dump that we are all building heaven on earth. And the way we're doing it is we simply realize that we're angels. And what is the characteristic of an angel? We're immortal. Our souls go on, right? We love all of humanity, no one left out. Since you take that attitude, quantum dumps. <laughs> the, uh, from Sky, Sky Selzma, at, at dinner last night, I learned that we, we simply choose. We choose to manifest. And we can manifest uh, unlimited energy if we want. It's all there, and it's actually going on. It's going on in experiments right now. And the problem is in these experiments, they just don't realize yet that they're tapping the zero-point energy. And it's, they're calling it water fuel because they're using water to cause uh, excess energy to occur over unity by a great amount. And what I'm going to briefly show today is how you can optimize these devices to get well over unity, close the loop, and make a free energy machine that taps the zero point energy. I'm going to move very fast through the slides. And you don't have to take notes on any, anything mentioned on the slide. Oh. 
Thank you. From this website, which we'll show again at the end, uh, this, uh, zero, this uh, PowerPoint presentation is available for download right now. And you can immediately download it and get everything that's on the slides that you'll see. And so you don't have to worry about writing things down right away. Uh, last year, right after I gave my talk, Sterling Allen presented a video that he put up on YouTube, and it creates a, makes a great summary from what I'm about to present. So John? You give me time at the end. There's a time we're losing now. <laughs> yes, we, we, we actually tested this out the day I arrived. It's not, you don't play the YouTube. You, because that goes out on the web. You play the play button, it's the local file. Oh, I see the problem. You have you have the wrong slide. You have the wrong PowerPoint. Okay. You go to the one that we download. That we we put on when I came. Yes, and it has the six files with it. I'm getting this time back. I need it all. <laughs> Can water provide the fuel of the future? While academia has been spurning the topic, hundreds if not thousands of hobbyists and independent investigators worldwide are working on various electrolysis-like projects which put out more energy than was required to run the electrolysis unit. These pursuits go by various names such as Brown's Gas and Water Fuel Cells and have various heroes such as the late Stanley Meyer and more recently John Kansas who is burning salt water using radio frequencies. A number of show interests are involved in the research and development of the various approaches as well. The famous 19th century scientist Michael Faraday defined the limit of output energy possible in any standard electrolysis scenario. It is well known in thermodynamics that it takes more energy to dissociate water into hydrogen and oxygen than can be returned when the hydrogen is burned. But these rogue experimenters of today are reporting output from their setups that exceed Faraday's limit many times over claiming seven times, ten times, or even more, producing as much as one liter of gas per hour using just a half a lot of electricity. The factors that seem to contribute to these effects include using a large number of stainless plates close together, the plates rough to facilitate releasing the bubbles, driving the cell using square waves, pulsed DC at kilohertz frequencies, and constantly modifying the frequency to optimize gas production. Maury King, who has three seminal books on zero-point energy, recently put forth a scientific model in which he suggests that the excess energy being observed in these unusual electrolysis setups comes from the zero-point energy by producing charged water gas clusters, which somehow achieve a self-organizing criticality that coherently activates and absorbs zero-point energy. The experimental setups are typically rather simple, which is leading to a proliferation of the number of people reproducing and working to improve the effect and its consistency to the point where it can be used to serve as a practical primary energy source, an energy generator that could operate anywhere there is water. Zero point energy is everywhere in the universe. It is the foundation of the fabric of space. Other groups, such as Exogen Technologies, are using these processes to purify water. These energy sources could actually produce culinary water as a byproduct. The day of water power via zero-point energy is arriving. Welcome to the future. Sterling does a great job. Every, oh, that's, that's good.
every year or so, not yet, uh, there's a video that comes out uh, announcing uh, a water power car, a car that runs completely on water. This occurred six weeks ago. Uh, it was a news conference was called out of Japan. Go ahead. With oil prices soaring and fuel protests spreading across the globe, it almost sounds too good to be true. A car that runs on nothing but water. And all kinds of water will do. River, rain or sea, they all make this car mobile. Even tea works. Japanese company Jinpax unveiled the eco-friendly vehicle in Osaka. Once water is poured into the car's tank, an energy generator takes hydrogen from the water, releasing electrons that power the car. The main characteristic of this car is that no external input is needed. The car will continue to run for as long as you have a bottle of water inside for you to add from time to time. According to Jean Pax, a liter of water will keep the car running at a speed of 80 kilometers for around an hour. The company hopes to go into mass production with a Japanese manufacturer. With car users around the world looking for alternative fuels to power their vehicles, Jean Pax may well have the solution they've been looking for. Michelle Al Khuri, Reuters. John, Fiola, I need you here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's, that's, that's a pretty wimpy car. Excuse me. In the U.S. of A, our inventors prefer something a little more macho. I quote the inventor. Yo, you want your environment clean? I'll clean your environment. Just tailgate me. These water fuel proje projects are extremely popular. If you just Google water fuel, you'll get millions of hits. And these are some of the base websites that have a blog and everything else to give you an overview of the whole field. It's very popular right now. They started the first science summer camp to teach water fuel cars to kids. Started by none other than Daniel Dangle. If you recognize the name, he's an inventor that's been been at it for years. Pinoy, he's in the Philippines. Pinoy maker of water power car. Still fighting after 30 years. He's realizing now that you have to get mass production. That's why he's teaching it to kids. Where's the energy coming from? It can't come from electrolysis. Right? Typical electrolysis separates uh, a oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, typically DC, it's conducting a lot of... It violates thermodynamics to say you get excess energy from it. There's, it takes you more energy to dissociate the water than you get back when you burn the hydrogen. Another way of looking at it is the energy state of water is lower than the energy state of hydrogen. You say, well, my device makes atomic hydrogen. Well, you gotta put more energy in still. You say, well, I'm gonna do plasma injection. Well, to make a plasma, you have to put more energy in still. So, where does, what is the energy source? What I'm going to present today is the hypothesis that the zero point energy is the actual energy source, and that these pulsing electrolyzers create charged water gas clusters, which are very similar to the charge clusters of Ken's shoulders, which he called EV for electron validum and EBO for exotic vacuum object. And I'm going to show you some theoretical work that shows how cavity quantum electrodynamics actually causes the microscopic bubbles to interact with the zero point energy. We're going, to, we're going to create a self-organized form in the water, 
and we're going to use high voltage spikes driven in phase with the natural resonances of the dynamics between the electrodes. A narrow gap is best, less than a millimeter between the electrodes, and no electrolyte. We want to minimize the current. The names for the gases produced is somewhat famous. Brown's gas, the stoichiometric mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, HHO's gas, or atomic hydrogen and oxygen, hydroxy, and we're going to add to the name charge water gas clusters. Add to the list. So here's the goal. We're going to max, minimize the input power, maximize gas production in order to produce this, a closed loop, self-running system. The electrolyzer produces the gas, which drives a small motor, which drives a generator. We rectify it onto a storage capacitor. The switching regulator presents a constant voltage to the pulse driver circuit, which optimally drives the electrolyzer by shifting the frequency to maximize gas production. The system self-runs. This the number one criticism from the academic community and the engineers that I interact with is why don't they prove it by making a self-running system? It's, it's over unity. And this is easy to do on the new electrolyzers that our people are making now when we work on the bench tops in a small scale. Here are the featured researchers in this presentation. You recognize some of the names? Just yell them out. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to give a special acknowledgement to Patrick Kelly. He has been extremely generous in sharing information on the web. He interviews the inventors and writes ex very clearly with lots of technical detail. Everything is for free for download. He has over 1,700 pages. And chapter 10, which you can download separately, is about the vehicle systems. And most of my slides are simply pictures from his chapter 10. I told you I was going fast. Any questions? <laughs> I'll take it. How can water clusters capture the zero point energy? You have to know a little bit about the zero point energy. Uh, Thurston had really helped out this morning. It's the basis of the uncertainty principle. In the vacuum, in, in quantum electrodynamics, it produces virtual pairs, electron and positron pairs that come into existence and go out of existence. It's, it's like microscopic electricity in these fluctuations. It's constantly going. Uh, there's lots of literature in the standard literature, in standard journals, and the Physical Review is considered our most prestigious journal in the United States. Timothy Boyer in the 70s was the leading proponent of zero-point energy, and he showed how quantum effects can arise, how Putoff picked up the ball in, 19, in the 1980s, and he showed how the hydrogen atom is stabilized from the zero-point energy. He has a paper published that shows that it can be an energy source without violating thermodynamics. It's a very important paper to debate academia, who says it can't be tapped as a source. That paper shows it can. He's also showed how gravity can rise from the zero-point energy, and a very important paper is he teamed up with Haitian Ruida, Ruida to show how inertia itself can come from the zero-point energy, which means if you can start to control the zero-point energy, you can create propulsion without feeling inertial stress, but effectively flying saucer propulsion. The model they use is called the quantum foam. This is from Wheeler's theory of geometric dynamics. Uh, electric flux enters through white holes, immediately leaves through these many black holes. These holes are on the order of 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters, Planck's length, 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the electron. This is a churning virtual plasma. This is a, this is a extremely dynamic and powerful ether theory that says the ether is effectively not modeled as a liquid, but it is modeled as a turbulent plasma. And the question is, can self-organization be triggered in the quantum foam. So when I posed this question in the 70s to the physicists at the university, they said, absolutely not. It's chaotic. It's and everything goes from randomness, from chaos. The law of entropy says you can't go the other way. However, in 1977, Ilya Prigogine wins the Nobel Prize in chemistry for showing how a system may evolve from chaos to self-organization. And the system has to exhibit three characteristics. It has to be nonlinear, driven far from equilibrium, and have an energy flux through it. And it turns out that the zero-point energy exhibits these characteristics. This is, a, this is a model of the Wheeler's orthogonal flux model of the zero-point energy. This is our space. This, imagine this is flat land, is our three-dimensional space, and the zero-point energy comes in at right angles, the orthogonal flux. 
as it comes through with an, in randomness, it's the natural and coherent vacuum fluctuations. If there's tilt to it as it comes through, there's a component in this direction, and we detect it as a polarized vacuum. If vorticity comes through, we say we detect it as an elementary particle. And this model, the flux, the zero point energy flux, is like the flow of a stream, and the whirlpool is the particle. It's like a whirlpool, and the flux has to always be occurring all the time to maintain the elementary particles as the whirlpool. Thus, the flux of the zero point energy maintains everything in existence. So what are the principles for calling the zero cohering the zero point energy? We use Pringenstein's principle. We use a highly nonlinear system like a plasma. We abruptly drive it far from equilibrium, and we maximize the interaction using ions or vortex form. The electron actually, especially in the conduction band, while it's in conductors, makes a very poor activator of the zero point energy. It's a smear charge cloud that's effectively in equilibrium with the zero point energy. Thus, you don't see these energetic vacuum effects from your normal circuits, normal everyday electronics. However, the nucleus of the atom is a different story. It has steep lines of vacuum polarization, and these can tr trigger self-organization of zero point energy, especially if the ion abruptly moves. The more abrupt the motion, the better. Do they see this in the experiments? They do. They call them exotic coherent vacuum states in quantum electrodynamics, arising from the heavy ion collisions. If we oscillate lots of ions together, it's called the ion acoustic mode of the vacuum. And it's for years they've known that it manifests energetic anomalies. These anomalies, they're now realizing, come from self-organization in the, in the plasma itself. And they include large radiant energy absorption, high frequency spikes, runaway electron, and anomalous plasma heating. The nature of the form that it takes is a plasmoid when it's self-organized. It's like a vortex ring. And they often observe them uh, occurring in pairs, with the ploidal rotation being in opposite direction, just like pair production out of the quantum foam of the vacuum. They're seeing it in the turbulent plasma, pair production of plasmoids. Ken Shoulders studied a microscopic version of them he called charge clusters. He uses abrupt pulse and can then launch a tiny form of ball lightning on the, on the order of a micron off the sharp point, and then he studies them. They typically contain, he measures them to contain a charge of approximately a 10 to 11th electrons. They drag with them about 10 to the 6 ions. They have a charge to mass ratio, like the electron, and they contain excessive energy. There's his website, by the way. He's sharing all his information. Uh -oh. uh, he lists the, the anomalies that, that they have. And these are very important anomalies, because uh, we'll see in a moment. The charged water clusters exhibit the same anomalies. They adhere to dielectrics. Many can clump together in a necklace formation. They can bore holes into high temperature, high melting point ceramics, like aluminum oxide. And he says it doesn't melt them. It really disrupts the electron bonds. It looks like melting, but it's really not melting due to temperature. Uh, he has done experiments showing you can produce element transmutation when he hits the target. And, and of course, that leads to radioactive remediation, because all you have to do is transmute radioactive elements. Here's the main point. Charged clusters and charged water gas clusters exhibit the same strange anomalies. George Weissman on his website uh, lists the anomalies of the charged clusters, the, char the Brown's gas or charged water clusters, and they have similar anomalies. They adhere to matter. They're electrically polarized. There's an electric shock when there's an abrupt discharge. Uh, they implode instead of explode when the gas uh, ignites. Uh, there's a cool flame. You ever, ever see the demonstrations of welding in, in Brown's gas? The guy passes his hand through the plane. It's a low temperature flame. Yet it can sublimate tungsten. The melting point of tungsten is incredibly high, and the, and the sublimation point's higher still. This is a huge anomaly. I'm surprised the scientific community just doesn't jump all over this, but they're afraid of paradigm changes. This itself has proved something extremely special is go going on. The 
cleanly through wood, metal, ceramics, that makes why it's a great welding gas. And there's claims of neutralizing radioactive material and claims of element transmutation. Water clusters are well studied in the standard scientific literature. Uh, here's a website that, that shows how gas gets trapped, they call them clathrates, in the interstitial spacing in the cluster. Oops, that didn't work. Uh, here's the MIT site. They call them water buckyballs. And here it is in the standard literature. A, they call it the hydrated electron negatively charged water cluster. This, this, is our, this is it. This is the charged water gas cluster that's producing the anomaly. It, it aggregates between liquid gas and steam. It's recognized in the literature. It's in a gas form. That's producing the magic. So how does it get the vacuum energy? Well, Thorsten gave a very nice illustration of the Casimir effect in his talk. And what happens when you take the bubble walls and abruptly compress them very, very fast, you create a coherent standing wave inside the microscopic bubble of zero point energy. And this interacts with the water and the walls of the bubble. Uh, Preventslick wrote a wonderful paper in Electrostatic Discharge Journal. And in one paper, he explains steam electricity, waterfall ionization, thundercloud charge separation, and sonoluminescence. The title of the paper, Bubbles and Steam Electricity. He shows that he can get charge separation from a cavity QED model that coheres to zero point energy. He separates the charge into hydronium, H3O, and hydroxyl, OH. In bubble qu quantum electrodynamics, the zero point energy is, is activated during, when the bubble wall abruptly collapses. And it continually increases the resonant frequency of the, inside the standing wave of the microscopic bubble. And it acts like an ultraviolet X-ray laser, which coincides with the disassociation frequency of the water molecule. He explains some luminescence. Uh, if you excite water with ultrasonics, especially if you mix some inert gas with it, like argon, the shock waves of the bubble collapse uh, creates a resonance, the same resonance in the zero point energy, which causes excimers to form. These are atomic com combinations that can form at a high energy state that could never form at the ground state. As the bubble relaxes, the excimers de decompose and emit the bluish light. Water, the water fuel projects can be classified into three main groups. One is the boosters. They improve gas mileage. These are by far the easiest to do. Um, it's, it's extremely popular. It's, it's, it's out on the web. And most of the YouTube and all the things that you see on the web are making boosters. Uh, to make a car run completely on water uh, is, is pretty difficult to do because you have to make a lot of gas very efficiently. And if you want to make a pure self-running, you disconnect the battery and prove you have a new energy source. That's the project we're shooting for. Uh, the boosters are often just electrolysis, actually. And they work with an electrolyte, produces current, and they can increase, increase the gas mileage by 20 to 50%. They have a bubbler, so that in case the gas ignites, uh, you don't blow up your electrolyzer. You just blow the top off your bubbler. Uh, SMAC is the nickname of a very popular booster because it's so easy to build. Patrick Kelly really liked it. He made one for his motorcycle, and what is he using? Stainless steel light switch plates. And he indents them, roughens up the surface, with, um, does cross-hatch sandpaper stitching. It's very important not to get your fingerprints on it, so you use rubber gloves. You have to keep these plates very clean. There's the booster assembled. Here's a side view of it. There's one, one uh, charge. These bolts are conducting. And here's the uh, positive electrode, and we, we, we actually connect the cross. And kind of, the yellow is where the insulator is, and these plates are floating, and the voltages uh, just go as equal potential surfaces. Uh, putting on the booster is not enough, though. If you take it on a newer car, the oxygen sensor says, hey, you're not burning enough gasoline, what, like, like the petroleum folks tell us to do. Tells the computer to dump more gas, so it can be burned in a catalytic converter where it belongs. Right? <laughs> So you have to finesse the oxygen sensor. 22 pages of Patrick Kelly's work is on that. By the way, I recommend reading his, his chapter before you ever start any of these projects or any research. He does, he does tremendous 
overview of what exactly to do. Uh, George Weissman provides uh, a, a electronic device, electronic fuel injection enhancer called FE, uh, that does just that. It, it finesses the oxygen sensor to, to allow you to burn very leanly, lean burn. Uh, various electrodes geometries were tried. Here is um, the spiral electrodes from Shigata Hasabi. A very popular booster is uh, just using wires. Two, two spiral coils of wires, one positive and one negative. They're just electrodes. And in this particular one, this, this is a very popular project, water for gas. They're using an electrolyte. The spacing is very large. And here's a picture of it from the water throttle folks. And um, we can play a video. The important thing on the video to see is that the, most of the gas is coming off of one electrode. This could be, it's likely hydrogen is coming off the elect negative electrode. Go ahead and pl play it. Transcoding error. I didn't fix this because it was easier to see the bubbles come off. So if we... I'm getting this time back. We can't play it, we're going to bore it. The, the video is not playing. Okay, let's abort it. Well, there's, there's Windows, there's the media player right there. Bring up media player. Play. Push play. Okay, that's a board. I'm going to move on. Okay, so one idea is uh, they have large spacing. Just wind these wires, rough stainless steel, especially when it's twisted strands, it very, provides a very rough surface. And then you, if you wind them on a form, you can create a very tight spacing between the positive and the negative electrodes. So that's an improvement to be done with that device. The water fuel projects have a pretty long history. It goes back to 1935 with Garrett. It's actually a pulsing device based on the commutator from the battery. Uh, there's newspaper accounts of him running a car on water. The modern parallel plate geometry is attributed typically to Rhodes, who uh, created the patent in 1965. Running this on DC, he didn't think there was anything special. He thought it was just electrolysis. Uh, Yul Brown made it famous, got the gas made, named after him, Brown's gas. Uh, he uh, applied the welding application and discovered all the strange things. And he did other types of excitation, like AC excitation and pulse DC, and he kept, and he kept getting better results. Uh, so this is Stan Myers. This video we got to play. Very few people have seen this. John, the Windows Media Player is what we want. Just, just push Windows Media Player and bring it up. This is a good one because um, a very few people have seen it, and it was the news announcement from one of the extraordinary energy com conferences uh, featuring Stan Myers. This, this is my last video, so we've got to get this one to play. And I'm getting the time back. Because we're going to have questions. And if you want to cut the tape, that's OK with me. A car that runs on water instead of gasoline. Can it be true? Well, inventor Stanley Meyer made an announcement today in Colorado Springs. A car that runs on water instead of gasoline. Can it be true? Well, inventor Stanley Meyer made an announcement today in Colorado Springs. He says he's come up with a device that will hook up to any engine and allow it to run on good old H2O. News 13's Kurt Goff tonight on the possible impact of the water fuel cell. Stanley Meyer says the answer to dependence on foreign oil lies all around us. In seawater, tap water, and rainwater. Any kind of H2O, he says, can power just about every type of engine. How? 
With the water fuel cell, it fits in the palm of his hand, but it could revolutionize the world. You're talking about a pollution-free, totally new source of energy, the voltage disassociation of water. The fuel cell converts water into a gas, hydrogen oxygen, which is released in the form of thermo-explosive energy. So the water fuel injector simply replaces the spark plug. We hook it to a hydrogen computer system which regulates and meters the flow going into the injector. It processes the water in such a way to release its thermal explosive energy. The man who invented an engine that can run on water says he's been offered a billion dollars in cash by oil producing countries to sell his patent. So far, he hasn't sold. Environmental specialist Jan Porter talked to the inventor who thinks that the U.S. auto industry could produce cars that run on water now if they wanted to. Our industrial base in the world is based on the utilization of Stan Meyer has a car that runs on water, and that's drawing crowds at this year's Extraordinary Science Conference in Colorado Springs. Myers has developed what is called the water fuel cell injector. The injector breaks down the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen is what powers the car. Basically all we do is replace uh, the spark plug and replace it with the water fuel cell injectors you see right here. We simply feed ordinary non-processed water, or processed water in here, and as the water goes into the injector, uh, it hits a very high pulse voltage frequency, which instantly converts it into thermal explosive energy. As a result, we can run this car down the road on water. Meyer's invention was introduced in Britain earlier this month, and now the Brits have followed him here. We recently took a scientific delegation to witness Stan's work, to really evaluate it, and came back saying, this is one of the most important inventions of the century. Yeah. Oh, get my PowerPoint back. A year later, Stan Myers was murdered. Uh, he was raising funding to build the factory, to build those water injectors. Two guys posing as investors poisoned him poisoned him at the Cracker Barrel restaurant. The story's written up here in this, on this website. Uh, there's audio tape interviews of dozens of witnesses, but the audio tape of the two Belgian uh, investors, so-called, are missing, mysteriously missing. Hmm. All right. Ah, the good news is, Stefan Meyer, Steve Myers, his twin brother, is still alive, and he was the electronics genius behind all of Stan's work. And here's a patent application by him. Uh, Dave Lawton also replicated Stan Meyer's work, and this guy's a heavyweight engineer from one of the major laboratories in, in the United Kingdom. He retired, and he, <coughs> he investigates these devices. Excuse me. I don't know. Should we try to play that? All right, here's his stuff in action. This is from YouTube, I'm presenting. <laughs> Here's an example of this uh, electrode. Stan, uh, Stan Myers was, was twice as big. This is an early electrolyzer by Stan. Uh, they're, uh, f they're five inches tall. His gap is on the order of a sixteenth inch, one and a half millimeter. So it's a relatively large gap. 
Uh, the circuitry is presented in the book. This is important. I started out originally using the uh, coils from the generator, just like Stan Myers did. Then he improved it. He simplified it just to drive the cells straight off the MOSFET. Got a pretty good result. Then he added another improvement recently. Uh, put, a, put a step up transformer, about 100 turns. Uh, he could create uh, a nice spike off of this transformer. He creates it on the trailing edge of the pulse, typically on the leading edge on a square wave. It takes a while to build up the magnetic field in the core, but then if you abruptly switch it off, it responds by collapsing and gives rise to a nice voltage spike. This improvement is uh, a key improvement. We can, we can actually up the voltage and lower the current, and it will tend to launch more charged water gas clusters by applying this improvement. You also notice a strange phenomenon that if he tapped straight off the pulsing on the, on the whole cell, he started investigating a cold current effect uh, that produces electricity straight up. So this is his latest work. Uh, Ravi Raju from India uh, contacted Dave Lawton, and he's likewise reproducing the device. He had a lot of trouble, though. He says, gee, I can't get it to go until he was told how to properly condition the electrodes. This is the biggest problem out on the blog. People says, I can't make these devices work. But when they follow the carefully the steps on conditioning the electrodes, then they start to get them to work. So a very important step. Uh, here's some of the crud that comes out and has to be cleaned out of the electrodes as it comes. He worked with very narrow gaps, 0.6 millimeters. Uh, the conditioning steps, the problem is the bubbles adhere to the stainless steel. Uh, they actually run straight up electrolysis. You work with potassium hydroxide, electrolyte, DC voltage, uh, until the steel exhibits a white, rough white surface. And then uh, you clean it up as it's running. And after the conditioning, you no longer need the electrolyte. It's very important if you want to optimize the overunity mode not to be conducting much current, and you don't want to be using an electrolyte. You just want to be pulsing the system. Uh, Bob Boyce was one of the early pioneers. And he's, a, he's a really great guy. I like to acknowledge him because he's sharing everything he has on the web. He realizes the only way to make this happen is to get massive replication, and he's sharing everything that he did. Uh, here he works with a lot of parallel plates. He has a large gap. Uh, um, he, the three millimeter gap, go up to 100 plates. He, there's careful instructions on how to build it. Uh, he works with an electrolyte, so he's not quite realizing the, the importance of the pulsing systems without one. And his gap's a little too big, unless you get high voltage spikes. Uh, I talked about the driver. He winds a special toroidal coil. Notice these frequencies. Those that have been researching this will notice this frequency, 42.8 kilohertz. That's the Keeley disassociation frequency, and these are subharmonics. He thought that was very important. Uh, many of the water investigators think, think it's very important. Uh, it's found by, from experiment that around 40 kilohertz is good enough. Every cell is different, and you actually have to adjust the frequency, and it's not any one frequency that's optimal. You have to continually adjust it to the dynamics of the cell. Hmm. Oh, there. oh, I see. I push it. You notice that I push it. Then you put I got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, high tech here. OK, so uh, they, they talk about the driver of circuit board. This is all in Patrick Kelly's paper in chapter 10. He, he's helping Bob Boyce distribute the information. Tells you how to build the circuit board. Talks about how to build the coil. Bob thought this was very important toroidal coil. It's just a transformer coil. Uh, talks about the importance of spacing. Goes through the details of how to space the coil as you wind it very carefully. Uh, they put the whole system together. The paper talks about that. Uh, ta also talks about the importance of ending engine ignition timing, which is extremely important on a small engine, which is what we're trying to run. On a normal gasoline engine, uh, you typically discharge it while, while the rate degrees before top dead center, because it takes a while for the explosion to occur. Gasoline burns very slowly, and then by the time the shaft moves eight, 10 degrees past top dead center, it pushes down the piston. However, it's bad timing for, for something that burns very, very fast, like the hydroxy gas, because we're f at, the, at the time we ignite it with the spark, the explosion occurs, and it's fighting the rotation of the shaft. 
So what they have to do is change the timing to after top dead center on these small engines. Okay, now we're, now we're timed properly with the explosion. But the problem is, on these little tiny engines, there's often a waste spark, which occurs on the second rotation of the shaft during the exhaust cycle. Now that's okay during uh, normal gasoline burn because we're before top dead center and we're firing a spark while we're discharging. However, if we change the timing, the waste spark fires as we're bringing in the gas, causes an explosion that blows the lid off the bubbler. So some, something has to be done about this, and the paper discusses lots of ways to deal with this problem, but you have to be aware of the problem if you want to work with a small engine. Exogen Power had a wonderful device. Uh, nobody can communicate with them. They seem to have dropped, dropped out. Yeah, I love the inventor. He made the patent. He patented the same thing three times. It's the same patent, three separate times. I was very intrigued by this. He made a very simple device, Stephen Barry Chambers. Guess what I recently found out? He's the brother-in-law of Stan Myers. He married Stan Myers' sister. No, the other way around. Stan Myers married Barry Chambers' sister. Anyway, just so somebody got In Utah, we get very confused about these things. <laughs> now, here's what's in common about the, all, all the, uh, in all the patents. The body and the figures are, are identical in, both, in all three patents. Uh, they talk about 40 stainless steel plates, a small gap, one millimeter spacing, uh, no electrolyte. He explored the entire spectrum to, from 2 to 250 kilohertz square wave. Uh, found the 90% duty cycles best. Runs at very low power. This is what we want. 12 volts, 0.3 amps. Uh, produces about 1 psi of gas per minute. Uh, he has this coil in the patent that he says uh, controls whether you make orthohydrogen or parahydrogen. And perhaps the most important thing, he's running a 1 kilowatt Honda generator. Exactly what we want to do to make a self running system. Uh, Parahydrogen has the spins opposite. It burns slow as a characteristic. Orthohydrogen has the spins aligned, and it burns very fast. I don't really think he's making parahydrogen. I'll tell you what I think as we move on. He, but he is creating something that burns slow. He's actually creating larger water gas clusters. Uh, the patents changed the title. In 2000, it was Apparatus for Producing Orthohydrogen and Parahydrogen. The same title in 2002, but he changed the title in 2004. Uh, the claims changed likewise. 2002 had many claims, really playing up the coil and the parahydrogen production in the claims. Uh, there were fewer claims in 2002, uh, but they were better written. And in 2004, he added a claim for variable frequency excitation, which is a very important point. And the coil's hardly mentioned until the last claim. So he's really playing down the, the coil at the end. Uh, the, the figures were the same in all the patents. Uh, there were, I was looking for what's special about your device from all the different patents. We works with parallel plates. Well, that's the same. He can work with many parallel plates, uh, wired in series. That's the same as many devices. He can work with concentric cylinders. Well, Stan Myers already had a patent on that. Uh, he had a simple driver circuit. I like that. This lo really opens up things for, for uh, replication. And there were the parameters. Ah, uh, now we got to something special. He put a coil underwater, and I didn't find out till later it was a toroidal coil. You actually can't tell from reading the patent. This figure doesn't indicate it. It's under the water. This is a strange thing to do. Uh, I talked that it had 1,500 turns, and after that, he hardly mentioned the coil. It doesn't matter what you put it over, any, any of the electro configurations. Uh, I talked about how to drive the coil, very low frequency. Here he drove it off, off the main driver circuit, but you don't have to. It just was convenient to do that. He said around 19 hertz seemed to be optimum. So I didn't learn what the coil did until I studied this device. William Power uh, has a website that's extremely popular, run, run your car on water. And then he says, and gas to double mileage. This is, this is a booster project, but it wasn't always. In his early versions of this paper, same paper, uh, he claimed it was, you could completely run your car on it. And I didn't think so, because it looked like it was too simple. Didn't, I didn't think it would produce enough gas in a one electrode device. But you can get these papers for free. He charges around 50 bucks to get the current copy, which is very nice and very well formatted. 
But effectively, the same information is in his earlier versions of the paper. Patrick Kelly didn't like it because he said nobody succeeded in running the car off of the water straight up. And here it is, basically a replication of Chambers' patent. He obviously had some information because he really stressed the coil. Talked about winding 2,000 turns, and this is where I learned about the toroidal coil. Look, I'm doing it, okay. Uh, a kit's for sale, the Hydrostar kit came out where they're making uh, the components for you to assemble. I don't like an opaque chamber. You want to see the bubbling to see if you're doing well or not. So you want to use something like uh, as you can see, I don't know if these electrodes are conditioned for you or not. So you likely have to, you have to see the bubbles and see if you need to clean the electrodes. But there's the coil, which is convenient because they wound it for you. So what's with the toroidal coil? It traps the magnetic field in the toroid. So why should that do anything, right? Well, there's still the vector potential that comes. And when we abruptly drive the coil of square waves, especially in the trailing edge of the square wave, we have a large change in the vector potential with time, and that gives rise to an electric field. And the electric field's toroidal in shape. And so that the ch these charged water clusters being, being polarized will naturally follow the lines of the toroid, and I believe the alignment creates bigger clusters, and these bigger clusters burn slower. Uh, there's some support in the literature that the vector potential can enhance water clustering. Here's a, here's a paper where the vector potential itself enhances water clustering. And here's a patent where they notice they can improve combustion by enhancing the cluster in the water. Uh, Paul Zagura, Zaguras uh, made an electrolyzer. That he has the, holds the record for the most, uh, most gas produced the fastest. Uh, he stopped participating on the blogs and, and the web. He, he was shut down. But basically, he made a car that ran on water. There's a suppression story. He tried to sell his electrolyzer on, on, the, on the web, on eBay, but they shut him down. Uh, here's an example. He worked with very narrow gaps. Whoops. And uh, this was suggested, a feed through all the electrodes. Right? So people were trying to piece together on the web what Paul Zagoras was doing. So to wrap up, uh, we use the pulsing electrolyzer to make charged water gas clusters. They exhibit the same anomalies as Ken Shoulder's charge clusters. Uh, the zero-point energy coupling occurs through the bubble cavity quantum electrodynamics, and we reviewed many systems. What's the best system? It's the simplest. We work with stainless steel electrodes. They're roughed up, cleaned, and conditioned. Small gap seems to be the best. The electrical drive, using large voltage spikes to, and minimum current, could actually relieve the need to make a very small gap. We wobble the frequency around 40 kilohertz, which was the secret of Paul Seguras. He just kept wobbling the frequency. And we optimize gas output in order to produce a closed loop on the system. So we can change the world. We just create a self-running system. We simplify it, post the information on the web, share it with each other and we manifest utopia on Earth. Thank you. Uh, the books, uh, you can get them through that, adventuresunlimitedpress.com, my three books. And any questions, and here's where you can download this PowerPoint presentation right now from this website, the Pez Wiki site. Okay, hey, we've got about uh, three or four minutes for questions. I got number one right here. I got number two in the back there. Uh, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand and we'll bring you the mic. Thank you. Excellent presentation. That was absolutely A plus. Really glad I came here. And um, in the field that I work in, nanotechnology, we've been studying something called microcavitation. These are very, very tiny bubbles. When they explode, they release huge amounts of energy. It's actually used for welding, believe it or not, in small surfaces. The Russians were using this as a potential method for propelling submarines. Does microcavitation in the same way relate to what you're talking about with the small bubbles? I just want to see if that was a comparison. Or do you know the term microcavitation? Boy, uh, the, the echo made it very hard to hear. I'm so sorry. Can I just hear I'll, the question? I'll say it much slowly. Uh, I don't need slow. I just need the, the summary. Something about you make the small bubbles, which are very, very good, and I believe they, they tap the energy. 
and you said something about gravitation? Uh, Microcavitation. Microcavitation, actual... absolutely. Right, okay. They found out uh, uh, many cases that cavitation produces this bluish glow, just right. like the ultrasonics. Right. I, I definitely believe we got a zero-point energy activation. And one last thought. At NASA last year, I saw solid-state hexagonal crystals of water. I'm not kidding. I actually saw it myself using microcavitation to, to, create, to catalyze the reaction that made the crystallized water. That's so. great. That's great. Because so. they can make, uh, make their structured water, clustered water. Uh, people were saying you have trouble reading the link to the website. It's PezWiki, PezWiki.com. The easiest way is to Google water fuel ZPE and then pick the PezWiki link. And you'll get to the video that, he, that I showed earlier. And there will be uh, this PowerPoint as well. Hey, Moray. Thank you. That was wonderful information. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Has anyone independently verified the toroid coil use in the electrolysis cell? Because that's actually where I started about five years ago. I was never able to actually make it work. Has anyone actually independently done that? I was completely intrigued by the toroidal coil in the water. And in fact, that's what made me, uh, because I said, what the hey, where did he think of that? I would love the corner of Steph, uh, Barry Chambers and ask him, where did you think of that idea? Because it's really esoteric on the, on the leading edge of what's going on. And um, I don't know if other people are doing it, making gas straight up from the toroidal coil. I haven't seen any of that. But, on these electrolyzers, it definitely seems to help. It seems to help uh, make a bigger cluster, which slows the burn, which changes. You don't have to advance the timing so much. And you could likely run the generator with a slower burning gas. And that's the biggest advantage, as I see it as a practical device. I did find that the characteristics were good. It burned slower, burned the, burned the hydroxy gas slower. Mitch? Yeah. A, a comment about that. Uh, what you call cavitation or vacuum collapse. That's Schauberger's uh, uh, work about implosion energy. And if super light or vacuum energy is zero, if we're under a radiant pressure from all directions, we're under a radiant pressure from all directions, uh, that's where the energy's come here. At zero point, I, I call it super light, but at zero point energy, we live in this sea of energy. And so once you are, col anything moving in is absorbing the energy coming in from all directions. I'll talk about more tomorrow on my talk uh, I, on super light. I, I think that's right on. The right. abrupt shock of the abrupt compression is activating the zero point energy coherently, microscopically in the bubbles. It's what's going on underneath. That's what, what's going on under these abrupt discharges when we're making these tiny bubbles. Okay. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, where did Faraday go wrong in his calculations? That's where you started the program, and you said something about Faraday, and he calculated how much oxygen, hydrogen you could get out, and now we're getting more. So what went wrong with him? I think the calculations are appropriate for electrolysis. It was very common sense, cal common sense calculation. He says, well, in electrolysis, I got the current. I got to make hydrogen and oxygen, so I got to absorb the electrons in the hydrogen, right? And they're given up by the oxygen. So it was a straight up calculation. So there's nothing really wrong. Uh, in what Faraday was doing. Well, what we're doing different now, we're not making straight up hydrogen and oxygen when we make a charged water cluster. We're creating a new state of water, actually. And it's a high energy state. And, and in, in this high energy state, one of the decay modes is it can decay to hydrogen and oxygen. Right? What we're actually making is a charged water gas cluster. So we're making something new. And this is what we're shooting for in these devices. We don't want electrolysis. The electrolysis mode is lossy. We don't want high currents. We want abruptness. We want to launch the same as ball lightning, except in a water form. Gee, it's easy, huh? <laughs> Well, you have to first absor observe it in, in an experiment. They weren't working pulsing systems with small gaps, creating discharges underwater. They were just working with DC electrolysis. There was no observation. When you're using salt water in these operations, what becomes of all the uh, salt and what other minerals are in the salt water? 
Yeah, I would say salt water, you'd have more conductivity. And as a result, it would, it, I think you're lessening the overunity type effect we're looking for. All right, we, we want to minimize current. So I would recommend uh, using something that, that's more of a dielectric, closer to distilled water, to really get the, uh, to the optimal mode in these devices. One of the problems is, of course, you're getting all modes all the time. You're going to have some electrolysis going on, as well as some of the water, charge water gas clusters. What we're trying for is getting more of gas clusters and a less electrolysis mode. What's your t uh, take on that Japanese car? Um, I think the group is, is naive because they're running out and giving a press conference, right? Um, but they're, they're ready to market. They're, they want, they're looking for somebody big in Japan to help them. And uh, I've seen many of these water car type uh, announcements over the years. You'll see them on YouTube. You go out on YouTube, you'll see them, the press announcements. And then you'll find the group's all excited and things are really good. And then you'll, they'll mention, oh, they got contacted by the Pentagon. The Pentagon's very interested. And then all of a sudden, they're in a classified project. Jiko, why they classify that? Well, I guess they don't want to say, well, our tanks run on water. What do your tanks run on? <laughs> Saudi Arabia would probably say oil. We got plenty of that. We, oh, they got the mic. Oh, she's next. So, um, I, I was going to ask, um, since you, you're developing a closed loop system, um, are you considering another kind of fluid medium as opposed to water? Um, I picked this, the, these class of projects because they're already replicating and it's, and it's easy. I mean, inventors all over the world, hobbyists all over the world are, are doing these systems. And so it's not, it's, I'm just going with the flow, right? And all we have to say is, gee, rather than go after cars, just work on the bench top, make a, make a closed loop system that self runs, teach others to do likewise, which, which prevents suppression, right? And spreads all around the world, and we prove we have a new energy source that's easy to do. You mentioned use of an electrolyte, uh, potassium hydroxide, which of course is highly alkaline and corrosive. And I'm just wondering why, why such a, a material rather than something neutral and uh, unco rel more uncorrosive like sodium chloride? Uh, that's, uh, the potassium, electro elect potassium hydroxide is typically used in electrolysis as the electrolyte because it, it doesn't really interact. It's more of a catalyst for the, interact for the reaction. Uh, in the cells that are on the mode of charged water gas clusters launching, we don't want any electrolyte like that. However, what they found just by experiment is that when they need to condition and clean up the uh, stainless steel electrodes, they found that this very caustic and dangerous uh, chemical is useful for doing that cleaning job. And before you do any of that, you want to read, read the literature first and, and learn how to safely use it because it is a dangerous caustic chemical. Okay, we've got time for one more. Just a comment about why water. Uh, water has an oxygen and two hydrogens at the top, so you have a separation of charge. It's a dipole. And because it's very tiny, water is likely to be more successful than any other uh, liquid there is. If you want to try it, try water. Uh, amen. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Maury King. Thank you. Thank you. The amazing and incomparable Maury King. Okay, we're going to take about a five.